Hello, and thanks for joining us for Civics Forward. I'm Mike Carney from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you decided to share some of your time with us today to discuss one of the most important issues in America, civics education. We're going to be joined by Danielle Allen of Harvard University. Uh, Danielle is going to talk to us about the work that she's been doing with a number of colleagues across the country to figure out new ways to ensure that civics has its rightful place in the classroom and in our country's conversations about where we've been and where we're going. So Danielle, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm just really delighted to be here and really appreciate the Chamber's engagement in this conversation. It's an honor to have the chance to share with you about the Educating for American Democracy Initiative. This is a major new roadmap for rebuilding excellence in history and civics learning for all learners K through 12 across the country. The project was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the US Department of Education. It's a rare project in the sense that the Trump administration and the Biden administration have both in, endorsed and supported this work. So we really do represent a special opportunity to move civic learning forward in this country. I'm gonna tell you more about this initiative, exactly what's entailed. But before I do, I wanna set the stage a little bit and share with you why I think reinvesting in civic education in this country is a critical need. For me, a few different alarm bells have gone off over the years about the health of our democracy. One of the first red alarm bells for me was that point in 2013 when Congress had a 9% approval rating. Congress is our first branch. If you go back to the history of democratic theory, you'll remember the legislative branch is the first branch of a separate and equal set of branches of government. And to have the people who for whom the legislature is their voice, approve of Congress at the rate of 9% tells you that your democracy is fundamentally ailing, your constitutional democracy. A second key alarm bell for me was a data point that came out about four or five years ago about young people. This was the data point that when you contrast generations born before World War II to generations who are born from 1980 onward, they have very different views about whether it's essential to live in a democracy. For those who are born prior to World War II, about 70% consider it essential to live in a democracy. For millennials age 40 and under, that number barely gets to 30%. And if you look as well at our NAEP proficiency scores, national achievement scores um, in civics and, and social studies, we find that barely 30% of our young people are proficient. If you have generational cohorts where fewer than 30% consider it essential to live in a democracy, then you have to recognize that we are failing at one of our core responsibilities as a society. We are failing to pass on our inheritance, our understanding of our, the value of our constitutional democracy, the understanding of how to build and sustain it over time. So these are very significant alarm bells, I think, about the health of our democracy and whether we're really restoring civic strength over time. And we really need to address these in part through investment in civic education. Here, I wanna say a little bit more about why it is we need to, to think in those terms of investing in civics education. And to understand this, I think it's worth taking a, a big picture arc, thinking about the history of educational policy over the last half century. Educational policy in the middle of the 20th century began to drive in the direction of STEM education really as a result of World War II. In World War II, there was an intense security need in the country to beat the Germans in the production of an atom bomb. And in the process of trying to achieve that, President of Harvard, James Bryant Conant, led the Manhattan Project with the universities around the country. And there was a tight partnership between the federal government and those universities to invest in the research and development needs to, to, to win that technological race. That close linkage in that war period became the beginning of tight connections between universities and federal investment around STEM fields and then STEM education. Then in the 1950s, when the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik satellite, there was a real sense of crisis in this country. Were we losing the technological race now to the Soviet Union? We'd, we'd won the, one, the race with the Germans, now what about the Soviet Union? That led in the Eisenhower administration and thereafter to really significant investments in STEM education. In the 1980s, we had another set of security concerns, this time economic security concerns. We were worried that we were losing a competition with Japan and other nations around the world. Our worries were again cast in the form of concern about STEM education. 
the view was we needed to really reinforce our technological capacity to compete in an economic sense, to develop economic security. And indeed, we did need all those investments in STEM education to achieve security on a global stage, both national security and economic security. But the data points I started with about young people and democracy indicate that there's another dimension of security. At the end of the day in this country, we want to be secure, we want to be competitive on the global stage as the kind of society we are, namely a constitutional democracy. In other words, a part of security is civic strength. We need civic strength in order to support effective governance and in order to pass on the form of our life together, our constitutional democracy, from one generation to the next. As over the years we invested in STEM education for security purposes, we disinvested from civic education. The result is that we now spend about 50 federal dollars per year per kid on STEM education and only five cents per kid per year federal monies on civic education. That imbalance really speaks to the need to think again about civic strength, to focus on how we secure that through our educational investments. The work of the Educating for American Democracy Initiative is an answer to that question. It is not a national curriculum. That is probably the first and most important thing to say. It is, however, a framework that invites educators all over the nation into a shared community of practice. The framework, the roadmap, has seven themes that we think, a team of scholars and practitioners from all over the country, about 300 people, seven themes that we think students K through 12 should all have the chance to dig into and think about. So those themes involve a focus on civic participation, a question of what is it and why is it important and valuable, a question about how this country came to have the geographic and demographic shape that it did. That was it's a theme about borders, a theme about we the people. How did we from so many different sources and origins come to form one people on this continent? A theme about our government. Um, how did we form the institutions of our government? A theme about transformations, how they've changed over time. A theme about this country in global context and a theme about the contemporary possibilities and challenges we currently have, the debates and arguments we currently have. And as we suggest students make their way across these seven themes, we provide a set of questions. It's sort of an inquiry based framework that we hope all students ages K through 12 will have the chance to encounter. Now, this was important, the notion that this is a framework built out of questions. The idea is that we could all be part of the same conversation if we are starting by asking the same questions. The roadmap doesn't propose the answers. We recognize that this is a country full of contention and debate and disagreement. And we consider it our job to teach those debates, to teach that contention, but as we do to also teach practices of civil disagreement, to teach practices of civic honesty and reflective patriotism so that people can put their different positions on the table together in ways that are productive. And we recognize our schools as having the hard job ultimately of building up in young people the habits and practices that support that engagement in civil disagreement. So this roadmap does have content in it. It is an, answer, it is, it is an effort to answer the question of what we should be teaching in order to have excellence in history and civics learning for all students. But again, it's not a national curriculum. It's not a top-down mandate. So here's what should be taught. It's rather an invitation to educators at a grassroots level to look at the roadmap and then consider how to build and design curricula in their contexts. Our goals for this project are very ambitious, very ambitious, and they really will require the participation of all stakeholders to, to fully realize. So we have the goal of reaching 60 million students with excellent learning opportunities in history and civics. That's basically all students. In order to achieve that, we need 100,000 100, schools that are, as we call it, EAD ready. That means they're ready to teach in this style of the Educating for American Democracy Initiative. And we need a million educators who are ready in this fashion. Now, I'm going to say more about those ambitious goals, but again, let me spend a few words on sharing with you who was involved in the project of creating this roadmap in the first place. I mentioned that we were a network of 300 people from across the country. We had researchers from Harvard, from Tufts, from Arizona State University, from Louisiana State University. We had practitioners from the social studies team in the Los Angeles County area to Arizona State to 
providers like iCivics and providers like the Bill of Rights Foundation. So in other words, we are a network of universities, we are a network of educators, and we are a network of nonprofit civic education resource providers. We span the geography of the country, we span the demography of the country, and we also span the viewpoint range of the country. And that was really important to our work. It has been a belief for several decades that it is not possible for us in this country to come to a shared view across our ideological divides of how we should be teaching history and civics for our young people. But we did achieve that in our work. Again, we built a big network of 300 people. We ran focus groups and we did achieve consensus across broad spans of diversity of opinion and diversity of background about what and how we can teach to achieve excellence in history and civics learning. I invite you to take a look at our website, Educating for American Democracy. You will find our roadmap there with those seven themes, with the questions structure, the inquiry structure, and with a set of design challenges. We use design challenges to give educators criteria for how they can think about their work. For example, one of the design challenges is the, the challenge that we have to find ways to narrate a plural yet shared story of American experience. We recognize that this country, our life together is built out of a diversity of experiences, good experiences and bad experiences. We have to be able to narrate those in a linked way, but bring all those pictures, all those stories into the picture together. We need an approach to history where it's possible to be honest about our past, including its bad elements and aspects, but without falling into cynicism. And we also need to be honest about its good elements, but without sort of flying off into adulation. So we need sort of that, that boundary between, again, honesty without cynicism and appreciation without, without adulation. That's the space that we are trying to find. Now, let me come back to implementation and why we need your help, how all stakeholders can help. The implementation framework that we use for thinking about this work is one that we call harmonized federalism. This is a recognition that our federal structure is flexible in its diversity and in its many jurisdictions. We began with the recognition that any successful civic education curriculum or approach is going to have to have a grassroots base. It needs to have legitimacy in the communities where it's being taught. So we need our school districts, our local educational agencies and our educators to really be making on the ground determinations of the best way of implementing a civic education curriculum. Every school we believe should be developing a civic learning plan. But at the end of the day, doing that work also requires support from the other levels of our jurisdictional system. Our educators and local educational agencies need support from the state in the form of how state standards are drafted. They need support from the state in the form of resources for professional development, and they need support for the state in the sense of an affirmation and support for a goal of reinvesting in civic learning and civic education. At the level of the federal government, we need support for data. In this country, we would do better if we could speak to each other in shared data vocabulary, and the federal government is well positioned to help us all actually build frameworks for thinking about data to measure the work that we're doing. We also need from a national level, but not from the federal government, curricular resources. Here, we are lucky in this country to have a great network of nonprofits, civil society organizations that are ready to step up and deliver classroom resources. I mentioned iCivics, I mentioned the Bill of Rights Foundation, there's also the Constitution Center. So we need to fully activate our network of civil society organizations around the country to provision our schools with all of the learning resources that they need aligned with the Educating for American Democracy initiative. So harmonized federalism is, is where we recognize the value and flexibility of our federal system, where we understand the importance of empowering those local decision makers, but where we also recognize that we can bring them support and assistance from the level of the state, from the level of the federal government, from the level of national civil society organizations. We best bring that support when we can harmonize the effort around some shared goals. Those shared goals are the ones I've articulated that we worked on in the roadmap, the idea that every student should have the opportunity to engage in a substantive inquiry-based way around the questions articulated in the roadmap. 
They also should have the opportunity to develop the skills of civil disagreement, of reflective patriotism, where we can combine critique and appreciation in forward going work of problem solving together. So that is a big picture of the work we've done on the Educating for American Democracy initiative. We need the business community as a set of supporters. We need you to help in your own communities, whether you work at a municipal level or support people at the state level or nationally or multinationally even, to think about how can you contribute to supporting districts that are within your penumbra of influence in developing those civic learning plans. How can you help us get to that point where we have a million teachers who have had professional development opportunities that equip them to teach in a way that's aligned with the Educating for American Democracy initiative? If we can support those 100,000 schools and that 1 million educators, then we will get to a place where 60 million students have truly had an opportunity for excellent civic learning, learning opportunities. So I, I thank you very much for your attention and engagement and really look forward to your questions. Thanks, Danielle. So if you have questions, please put them into the chat. I have a few that I'll get started with, uh, but we very much look forward to questions from the audience. Danielle, going back to the beginning, you, talk, you used the phrase civic strength. Can you explain what that means and why it matters and why it might matter to an employer? Sure. So... If we think about the pandemic that we've all just lived through, we watched while polarization really tangled up our country in thinking about the response. And I say polarization because I really do think that the fits and starts of our ability to respond, um, the ways in which we were really slow out of the gate leading to you know, more than 500,000 people dead and the like, it you know, really does reflect polarization, the fact that we couldn't come together and govern together effectively. And so I really do put the issue of polarization on you know, both, both houses, so to speak. Um, and that fact that polarization afflicts governance um, is just a documented fact, historically speaking, it's a documented fact empirically in political science. Um, other countries around the world that are also afflicted by polarization also found it more difficult to govern through the crisis of the pandemic. So civ civic strength is about the resources of cooperation, of coordination, of mutual tolerance and forbearance that permit democracies to make decisions together. Um, civic strength is about the mutual commitment of all of us to one another and to our shared constitutional democracy. Democracies need these resources very specifically. An authoritarian regime, for example, of China, can really use autocratic measures, for instance, to govern through a crisis and to be able to move efficiently, even in the time of a crisis. A democracy can't do that and remain a democracy. Instead, our best tool for working our way through a crisis is civic strength. Again, that ability to come together, to find compromises, to govern on a shared path. We have to rebuild our resources for that, not just for moments of crisis, but even for regular moments of policy making, the effort to work our way through the issues that life throws up at us as a society. So the fact that we have challenging decision making contexts, the fact that many issues go unresolved because we can't actually reach resolution across the sort of the fights and divisions of our parties um, is a sign of weakness um, for the country. And it is really something that we have to overcome. We want to compete on the global stage as the kind of society we are, namely a constitutional democracy that requires that we be able to rebuild that capacity to work together effectively. So we have an audience question, and it, it actually is in line with the question I was just going to ask, which is, so the, the, the questioner writes, how can higher education institutions continue the work done in K through 12 with educating for, America, educating for American democracy? I would add to that, what role do employers play? I know that the, the work that you and, and the hundreds of other people have been doing has focused on K through 12, but it sounds like there, we have a multi-generational challenge. So what is what is the role of post-secondary institutions and how can we ensure uh, that the civic that we're creating opportunities for people to develop the skills and the knowledge they need beyond school? Is, is that something you've given thought to? Sure. No, thank you. I think those are important questions. I think that we can and should encourage employers to 
open up civic learning opportunities um, to their staff. Um, there are programs that are starting to emerge to offer this. There's one based here in Boston called Gen Unity, which does bring together cohorts who've been nominated by employers to take them through a process of learning more about how municipal government works, how state government works, and to have them work on identify issues or projects of their own choice and learn how to use the skills of civic engagement to contribute to those issues. At Harvard here, um, I have developed an online adult education course called Civic Engagement in Our Democracy, um, which I hope might be broadly used by people in all contexts and sort of lifelong learning context. And it does seek to help you know, rebuild people's understanding of the philosophical foundations of democracy, rebuild people's understanding of how the mechanisms of our political institutions operate, and also activate people's own motivation, their desire to take responsibility for the communities in which they live and to bring their own agency to the work of community problem solving. I think higher education can also help in two ways. Our K-12 educators need support from higher ed. Because we have not been investing in history and civics learning, there are not as many opportunities for our educators to master the disciplinary content of these fields. And we need our higher ed organizations to come back into the game of providing those professional developmental opportunities in the disciplinary um, specifics, um, the disciplines of history, the disciplines of political science and the like. In addition, um, within higher ed itself, we also certainly would benefit from rebuilding of some of the courses that really introduced students to the, again, the operations of the machinery of constitutional democracy philosophical foundations of constitutional democracy. We don't have as many um, course offerings in those spaces as would be um, ideal. So we have another question uh, that gets at some differences in terms of political participation by people who studied STEM fields and people who studied humanities. I guess, you know, a few years ago, Tom Friedman from the New York Times wrote a column about the two codes. And his, his argument was that Every, every person in America needs to know two codes, the Constitution and coding. It, as, as we have the conversation about STEM and we have the conversation about civics, how do we bridge that divide and, sh and make sure that everyone understands that, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're going to grow up to be a plumber or a president, you have to have this kind of set of tools and basic knowledge in your tool belt. You know, what, how do we, how can we overcome that gap and close that gap? Well, I think that's a really important question. And I think we, we, we have to learn how to integrate these categories of learning. One of our needs for improving civic learning is simply more time in school on these subjects. Um, on the other hand, it's not as if we want to take time away from STEM. We need that too. We, it's a both and situation. The result of that is I think we do have to give thought to innovation in how we teach STEM. We need to give thought to intersections between English language arts and history and civic learning. I think across all of these disciplines in our K through 12 sector, we have to figure out how to be able to integrate a civic learning component into them um, as a way of strengthening the learning taken as a whole. So in that regard, I think one of the most important things we need to do is really invite our STEM educators into the conversation around civics and have them start um, experimenting, thinking through how they would design um, components of civic learning uh, into the coursework they're doing. We did one fun thing this year and some work we do with grade eight um, curricula in Massachusetts. Uh, we use the electoral college as a way of actually designing a math lesson. So there are places you, know, you can really find uh, interesting ways of bringing the two subject matters together. So the last question I'm going to throw out is, so we, we have somebody who wrote in a question from the audience, and it's a good question. If a company provides resources to a local school district to fund civic education, what, if any, should be the level of involvement of the company? I'd like to broaden that because one of our observations as we've talked, we spent a few years trying to understand what's going on with civics in America, not just in this classroom, but more broadly. One of our observations is that uh, when people think about the business community's engagement on this, this issue, they gravitate toward, well, just provide funding and someone else will do it. I would like to get your thoughts about what is, what are some of the potential roles that people in the audience and who are in the business community at the local level or at the national level can play in, in the kind of broader effort to elevate civics? 
I think in addition to providing funding, business leaders can, can convene people and can use their convening power to build a conversation. I think one of the hardest things about civic learning is that, of course, one of our first principles is the First Amendment. You know, and the idea that one of the things we're trying to cultivate is the capacity of all of us to be independent thinkers, independent speakers, people who want to contribute the best of their own thinking to deliberation about the problems facing their communities. Um, of course, as we seek to be independent thinkers and independent speakers, we also bring with us an ethical responsibility to understand uh, what counts as a good contribution. That means a commitment to truthfulness. It means a commitment to um, displaying you know, one's reasoning, the sort of path of argumentation and, and being responsible for the quality of that argumentation. It means being responsible for the quality of the evidence one uses and the like. So we have to couple the idea that we're trying to cultivate a whole culture of independent free thinkers and free speakers who are also committed to truthfulness and trustworthiness and um, high quality use of argumentation. And so the reason I'm saying that is because in, in the civic learning space, then the job of a convener is to bring people together in ways that both provide space for that free thinking, that independence, and that also supports those commitments to those norms of truthfulness and trustworthiness. And it can be a little hard sometimes to be a convener and to know that you're going to be convening people who might end up saying things that you disagree with. But that is truly the responsibility in the civic learning space. I mean, it's, it's the job of all of us to, to build convening spaces where we know that people will come together with whom you know, we, don't all, we don't agree fully. Um, but the point is that we're learning how to do the work together of disagreeing in productive ways. Um, I think that's a new um, sort of orientation for all of us to take, in all honesty, to convenings. Um, and I think that's, there's a learning curve that we all need to um, climb up in order to do that work. Well, thank you, Danielle, for taking the time today to talk about the work that you and your colleagues have been doing through the Educating for American Democracy project. Uh, I like that we're ending on building a convening space as one of the things that the business community is doing or can do. Uh, that's one of our objectives uh, through Civics Forward. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. We're going to hold these convenings on a fairly regular basis going forward. So if you have suggestions about topics or people that we should consider including in future Civics Forward programs, reach out to us. We'd welcome your thoughts, your suggestions. Uh, we do want to you know, facilitate a conversation about how America can rebuild civic strength. We're not all going to agree on the right path forward, but what we are going to agree on is that it's our responsibility to strengthen our democracy. Uh, and the business community has a critical role to play in that. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for sharing your time. Please visit uschamberfoundation.org if you'd like to find out more about our work in this or other areas. Uh, but we wish you well. Uh, please have a great day and make sure you get vaccinated. Thank you very much.